Once you've got a scatter plot, adding color is a good way to make things pop out. But in order to make this readable, we need to add a color legend. We'll discuss encoding data with color, d3.scale ordinal, d3 color schemes, building a color legend, guides, d3 axis DOM structure, selection.join, the long form, handling nested elements with D3 selections, centering text vertically, and color brewer. When we look at this iris dataset scatter plot, there are certain clusters. There's a bunch down here, and then a bunch up here. And I wonder why they are clustering like that. Could it be that they are different species of iris flower? We can find out by using color to distinguish between different species. I'll start by forking this scatter plot, and I'll call it scatter plot with color. In this data set, there is a column called species. I'd like to make it so that Setosa has one color, Versicolor has another color, and Virginica has a third color. Just like we define value accessors for X and Y, we can define another value accessor for color called color value, and this will return d.species. Now that we're passing that in, we can modify our scatter plot to accept that, and then we can define another scale along with X scale and Y scale called color scale. And because this will map different discrete values to different discrete colors, we want to use scale ordinal, which we need to import from D3. And once we define the scale, we need to define the domain and the range. With ordinal scales, the domain and range are both arrays. For the domain, we want it to be all the unique values returned by our color value accessor. We can say data.map color value, which will return all of the values for color value, including duplicates. So it, this would return Setosa, say, 50 times or so. But one nice thing about setting the domain of an ordinal scale is that it automatically deduplicates for you. We can verify this by saying console.log color scale dot domain, invoking it with no arguments. So this will be the getter version of dot domain. It will get the domain out of the scale. And sure enough, it outputs Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Now we need to set the range to be an array of colors. In our old marks and channels example, we used scheme category 10 from D3, and we can use that here as well. In our scatter plot, I will import scheme category 10 from D3, and then we can use it as the range of our color scale. Now that we've got our color scale defined, we can use it to set the fill attribute of our circles with dot attr fill. And then we can use the exact same pattern that we use for x and y, just changing y to color. We take our row object, pass it through the color value function, which returns one of those values for the species, and then we pass that into the color scale, which transforms it from the domain to the range. And lo and behold, we get different colors for our dots on our scatter plot. Now we can clearly see that those clusters are based on the species. All right, that's how you can use D3 ordinal scales to define color. 
scratch that. All right, that's how you can use D3 ordinal scale to visually encode a categorical column using hue. We've colored these circles, but if we turn around and show this to somebody, they're going to have no clue what the colors mean. So that's why we need to add a color legend. I'm thinking we put it right here in this white space and we have a little circle that's green that says, okay, this is Versicolor. And then another circle that's orange that says this is Virginica or whatever it may be. And then a third circle that's blue with another label over here. Currently, our scatter plot component is the thing that is responsible for adding the axes based on the X and Y scale. The umbrella term for axes and legends is guides. To add a color legend, let's follow a similar pattern by copy pasting that logic for axes. And instead of calling a function called axes, let's call a function called color legend. And that function will need to know about the color scale. And also a label should be associated with this. I'll call it color legend label. This can be passed in along with the X and Y axis labels from viz.js. And we want that, the color legend label, to be species. There we go. Species is what should show up as the title of the color legend. All right, so over in scatterplot.js, we are importing axes like this. Let's import also color legend from dot slash color legend. And that's going to be a new file called colorlegend.js. And I'll start by exporting a function called color legend that accepts a selection and an options object where we can destructure the things that are passed in, including color scale and color legend label. All right, this is where we should add our color legend, which will be quite similar to the axes. So let's just review how these axes work. This logic creates a new group element with a class of x-axis, transforms it to put it in the right spot, and then calls out to D3's axis functionality. The part that manages the group element is something that we'll also want for the color legend. So I'll paste that logic here and change x-axis to color legend when we select and also when we assign the class. The idea here is that there will be one group element that contains the entire color legend so that we can move this around by translating it and everything inside of it will follow. So we do want this part as well. We set the transform attribute to translate and this is where I think we're just going to want to pass in some custom parameters to position it at a specific spot. Let's call it color legend X and color legend Y, which we can also grab from our options object. And these should be configured from our scatter plot right here. And those in turn should be configurable from the top level viz. So I'll add those right after the margin. And I'll start it out at, I don't know, 500. 500 and we can tweak it from there. The easiest thing to do is probably to add the label. So I'll do that first. This is quite similar to the X axis label. So I'll just copy that logic and paste it here in our color legend. But instead of going on the selection that gets passed in, this should actually go inside of the group element, which I'll call color legend G because it's a group element and then we can attach this text to there and I'll change the class from X axis label to color legend label and change the class as well and we don't need this one alignment baseline hanging and instead of X axis label 
this should be color legend label and this X and Y doesn't make sense anymore so I'll just put it to zero for now we might want to configure these as well later okay we got it to show up there it is down there it says species so I want that to be over here instead to accomplish that I'll just tweak color legend X and Y a value of 800 pushes it over to the right for X and then a value of, I don't know, 300 puts it right there and that's about where I want it. Alright, let's go about adding those we can call them ticks, they're kinda like tick marks in a way and each of these ticks will have a circle and a text inside of it. Before we write some code I want to show you what the DOM structure of D3 axis ticks looks like because we'll be creating something awfully similar to this. The axis itself is an apparent group element with a class Y axis. And then check this out, each tick has its own group element that is translated to position it in different locations vertically. And these each have a class of tick. And then within each tick, there is a line and a text element. We want to do pretty much the same thing, but instead of a line, we want to have circles. Let's start by provisioning these parent group elements. I'll start by saying color legend g dot select all g dot tick. I think I'll give it a class of tick just to be consistent with the axes. Dot data now what should the data be here? Remember we want one entry for each color and these colors come from the color scale which we do have access to here. The color legend is essentially a visual representation of the scale itself including the domain and the range. The domain values will correspond to the labels and the range values are the colors themselves. And if we have a value from the domain, we can get the corresponding value from the range. Therefore, I think it makes sense to put as the data here, color scale dot domain, and then dot join G, and then we give it a class of tick. There we go. This just creates the outer group elements. But how do we create nested elements within each of these group elements. This is the first time we're going to have to venture into the more complex form of the dot join API. In the documentation for selection dot join, we can see that it actually takes three arguments and the second and third arguments are optional. This example code shows the simple form that we've been using where we just pass a string into dot join. And if we do that, just passing a string, it's actually a shorthand, which is equivalent to selection.append with the given element name. And if you don't specify the second argument and the third argument, which are update and exit functions, they have defaults. They default to the identity function and then calling selection.remove to handle when data elements are removed. So this shorthand is actually equivalent to this longer form where we call dot join and the first argument appends a circle. The second argument does nothing but it returns the update selection. And then the third argument will remove the element if there's no longer any corresponding data element. We can use this longer form and take advantage of the enter argument to append children to our group elements, one circle and one text. Over in our code, this would look something like this. We pass a function that takes as input the enter selection, and then we call enter.append g. Now this does the same thing as we were doing before, and it's important that this function return 
the result from dot append. So that's why we can use dot call to get access to that appended group element and then write some code that has a side effect. Namely, we want to append a circle element and also a text element. Okay, let's inspect the DOM to see if this worked. If I right click on species and say inspect, we can see that indeed our color legend group contains three group elements with a class of tick and each of these contains a circle. Now it's kind of interesting that CX and CY are defined here because we didn't write any code to define those. I think what's happening is that the scatterplot code for rendering the circles is accidentally picking up on these circles. Let me fix that by making the scatterplot logic more specific. We can give these circles a class of mark because these are marks. We select all circle.mark and then we give it a class of mark. Okay, now if we inspect our color legend DOM, we can see that our ticks have empty circle elements and text elements inside of them. Now all we need to do is translate these group elements, specify the circle radius and its color, and specify the text. Okay, taking a look at our code here, I see that we're assigning a class of tick out here, but this actually, I think, makes more sense to do inside here, right after we append this group element. And I like to keep things simple, meaning let's let this function here just be responsible for scaffolding the DOM, and then we can write some other code that populates it. So we can use dot call down here to write some code that operates on these group elements. And we can get at these circles by saying selection dot select circle. And to get them to show up, we need to specify the R attribute, the radius. We'll say 10. Okay, we're getting somewhere. We got a circle to show up. There's actually three on top of each other. Let's set that translate so that we can see that there's actually three circles. We specify the transform attribute to be a function of D and I, the index in the array. And that could be a string that says translate zero in the x direction and we want it to go down so we can specify a value in the y direction like i times some constant. I'll put 30 for now. And now we can see that there are three separate circles over there. I'd like to make this configurable. I think I'll call it tick spacing and we can destructure that from our options and give it a default value of 30. That could be overridden if we wanted to. Now in addition to specifying the radius, we want to specify the color by setting the fill attribute to be a function of D, which remember is a value from the color scale domain. So to get the corresponding value from the range, we can just pass that into our color scale. And now we get colors on our circles. And notice that this construct is sort of degenerate. It's a function that takes as input a value and just passes it into another function. So we can just set color scale here as our fill. All right, now let's work on those labels. We can use the same pattern for getting at this text element. We can say selection.select text and we want to set the text content of the DOM node with uh, dot text. And this can just be the identity function. And there we go. 
we have our labels. All right, now it's a matter of just tweaking things so that everything is uh, looking proportionate and well laid out. One thing I notice is that the font is different here. It's not sans serif. I'd like to make this font the same as the font for the tick marks. Check out how D3 Axis does it. It sets the font size and the font family on the parent group element. And it turns out that these attributes sort of trickle down to the children. So I think I'll do the same. Font size is 10. Font family is sans serif. Yeah, on the parent group element, I'll set the attribute of font dash size to be 10, and then font family to be sans serif. And now if we take a look at our text, it does look to be the same as these ticks. I'd also like to make the text centered vertically with respect to the circle. And this is something that D3 axis does for axis left and axis right by setting DY to be this sort of magic number, 0.32 EM. It's kind of mysterious and cryptic, but hey, if it works for D3 axis, it works for me. All right, this is on our text element. We're going to set the DY attribute to be 0.32 EM, and that should center it vertically. Yeah, it looks better. All right, now let's move that text over a little bit so that it's not overlapping with those circles. I believe in D3 axis, that's called tick padding. So I'll introduce another option here and also set the default to 10 for now. And to move our text elements over, we can set the X attribute on them to be tick padding. Okay, that moved them over, but I'll make it a little bit bigger so that there's a bit of a gap. Let's say 15. All right, that looks decent. Now let's just make sure species is positioned nicely. So this is our color legend label. I don't think we need text anchor middle. We don't actually want it to be in the middle. Okay, that moved it over to the right. Now we just want to move it up a little bit. For that, we can set Y to be maybe minus 10 or minus 20. And now it becomes a question of design like where you want this to be. We could align it vertically with the other text by setting X to be tick padding. Yeah, I don't know. You could tweak this all day. I think I'll just make these configurable. I'll call it color legend label X and color legend label Y. And I'll add these to our options object and give them some defaults. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Now we can actually read what the colors mean from this color legend. Since this is the first time we're using this new pattern, let me just do a review. In viz.js, where we invoke our scatter plot, we added some new options the color value accessor the color legend label, and the color legend x and y position. In our scatter plot, we unpack those new options here, color value and the color legend options. And then down here, right after we invoke our axes module, we invoke our color legend, passing in those options and our color scale, which is an instance of D3 scale ordinal, where the domain is derived from the data in our color value accessor, and the range is scheme category 10. Which, by the way, comes from a part of D3 called D3 scale chromatic. 
Scheme Category 10 is just one of many of these color schemes that you can choose from. And color schemes are, you know, fixed sets of colors. But color is a whole genre of stuff with these diverging interpolators, perceptually linear interpolators, various sequential multi-hue color schemes, and even a couple of cyclic interpolators. And by the way, all that stuff in D3 Scale Chromatic is inspired by this older tool called Color Brewer, which is an amazing tool originally for maps, but it's been a hugely influ influential thing in the DataViz community. Shout out to Cynthia Brewer, Mark Hauer, Harrower, and the Pennsylvania State University. So anyway, we're using Scheme Category 10, and then we're calling this Color Legend component with all this stuff. Color Legend unpacks all that, and it also define some default values for these other parameters that you could specify from the top level if you wanted to. And then we create a single group element that will contain the color legend and we position it using the transform attribute according to color legend X and color legend Y. And we can take a look at the DOM to see what that looks like. So this logic here generates this here group element with a class of color legend and a transform. Everything else goes inside of this. So that group element gets to be this variable and then this chunk defines this label which is species and then we create these tick group elements based on the color scale domain which in this case is an array of three elements, Satosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And then we use the long form of dot join, where we specify a function that handles the enter case. And by the way, you can think of the D3 data join as this Venn diagram, where on the left you've got data, the elements of the data array. And on the right, you've got elements as in DOM elements. And the enter selection is what gets triggered in the case where there is a data element that does not have any corresponding DOM element yet. In the case of our code, this happens on the first render only, and then on subsequent renders, it just reuses those DOM elements that were scaffolded in the enter case. So that's what's going on here. We're just scaffolding these tick group elements and appending circle elements and text elements inside of each one. And you can see that here. Here's the parent and then these children, circle and text. Then we specify a translate to move around these parent group elements so that they spread out vertically. We set some font attributes that do sort of trickle down to these text elements. We use dot call on the parent selection of those group elements to get at those children elements that we added in the enter case. For those circles, we set the radius and we set the fill to be color scale, which is a more concise way of saying a function that takes as input D, one of the elements from the color scale domain, and then passes that into color scale to get a value from the range, one of our colors. And then we set up our text label. We use this crazy dy trick from d3 axis, move it over to the right by tick padding, and then set the text content of the DOM node to be the identity function. And this, again, takes as input a value from the domain of the color scale, which is one of these strings, Satosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And that's it. That's how you can create a color legend using D3.